Hey everybody, Coach here. How you doing? Man, I took a week off last week. It felt great, but it wasn't like I had just kicked in the clutch. I had basically been very, very busy here at Brook and Pond, mainly keeping up with the winter weather. Yeah, we're talking about uh, snow that accumulated over the week. I had to do a lot of clearing, had to do some preparation for my vehicles, and now I am back. Hey, I want to... Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit, and I'm going to start doing this, and if you don't like it, tell me if you don't like it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of, little bit of weather as far as landscaping capability. Can you do it? And I'm speaking only about myself, but here's what I'd like to offer, is I'd love to hear from you guys as far as what you have currently, when you listen to this, what you have currently at your place, and are you landscape capable right now? weather-wise. So, without further ado, hey, I'm starting in with an overnight low of 5, 5 degrees Fahrenheit, and a high today of only 18, maybe 20, but that's only going to be in the sun. I have ground freeze that goes down about 4 inches now, 4 to 6 inches, depending on whether you're in the shade or in the sun. So, my landscape capability, hmm, yeah, I'm going to put it right at zero. So today we are talking about the most current trends for landscaping in the residential world and what those trends look like for the 2024 season coming up, which is obviously just around the corner. So I appreciate you giving me that break last week and I am back. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. So let me get this off my chest right out of the gate, right at the top of the show here. And that is regarding the definition of trends. Now, trends are nice. You know, trends are ooh and ah in the magazines and in online pictures and stuff. Those trends are uh, what kind of inspire us, what lead us to say what could be out in the yard. However, however, they also lull you into a, a, a sense of that's what I want. But are they really realistic? Are they realistic for the average DIYer and even realistic for some professionals, not all professionals out there are capable of putting in some dream yards. They're capable of putting in standard yards, but when it comes to the fancies, some pros fall short. I knew where my limitations were when I did it, I'll tell you that. I didn't get into uh, pools, I didn't get into super fancy structural builds, nothing. You know, I was kind of a the blue collar landscaper. I was the one who was not the cheapest and certainly not the most expensive. And I catered to a niche market that could afford a professional, but not the off the top. I can remember a, a landscape job that was north of the town I was in. And this, this family had money. And I mean hundreds of millions of dollars. And they contracted to a friend of mine to come out and landscape five acres. Five acres. And it was actually featured on a landscape uh, magazine. It took my friend three years to complete that. And it had everything from scaled down, take the grandkids on a locomotive train through the property. It had swimming ponds, it had huge waterfalls. It went on and on and on. And they spent close to $35 million on this landscape. Quite a, quite a uh, dreamy, lofty goal. And if you can afford it and you can find the right person to do it, boom, do it. But is the honest answer, this realistic goal, fall under the DIY umbrella? The honest answer is sure. Maybe. Yes, and for some, no. Based on a few factors, based on a few factors at your disposal, and let me go over them, there's about five. Number one is time. Do you have the time? 
you know, if you're a, a single gal or a single, gr a single guy and you have money, you have a good job, maybe you have a schedule that allows for you, uh, like if you're self-employed or uh, you have lots of days off during the month or you're very seasonal and you can throw yourself into a multi-week, multi-month project, then you have the time. Most folks nowadays, there's at least one of us in the family working full-time, if not both. You got kids, you got pets, and you got stuff to do all the time. And sometimes time is the biggest culprit of turning people off and away from landscape improvements. Number two is the cost. Have you been saving? Have you been setting aside, you know, a, uh, a resource jar so that when this time comes about and you've done all that I might suggest in that 15-step DIY process that I have on the website, are you ready to absorb the cost? And there's lots of ways you can do it. You can, you can go get onto one of these trendy, these trendy landscape ideas and take out a second mortgage if you can afford it and throw it in, do a good job, and you'll have a wonderful, a wonderful new landscape. A lot of us were kind of at the mercy of that mortgage, and we really don't want to afford any more debt, especially the way the world is right now. So cost can sometimes be prohibitive. And how about the complexity of your landscape dream? Complexity really kind of, hmm, it hinders us because we want it, we think we can do it until we get in the middle of it. I had so many calls over the years where people have leaped off the deep end of the pool, landscape-wise, and then my phone rang and said, can you come help us out? The other thing is availability. I mean, for the last three years, a lot of resources, materials, and that kind of stuff have been kind of on the scrimp side. And what was available was astronomically off the charts expensive. So availability might affect when you can actually do it. And finally, what is your skill set? Is your skill set capable of taking on something like this? If you do have the time, if you do have the money, and you know that things are available and the complexity does not scare you, do you have the skill set in which to do it? So trends will also be somewhat geographically dependent as well. Kind of hard to do a southwest desert theme up here in Maine where I'm at. Mostly, but yeah, I mean, it's really kind of hard to do a desert landscape up here. Conversely, doing something up here down in Florida, you know, so it's kind of where you're at and what are you really wanting to put in and will it work where you're at? Okay, now that I got that out of my way. But here are some trends that are being sought after by consumers, either DIYers or those seeking professionals to complete. And they're, yeah, pop, top five, top six or so. And the big, big trend right now everywhere seems to be native, native landscapes. Use what naturally grows around your area. Native landscapes can be a great way to mirror the local surroundings and really blend, kind of, blend your landscape into uh, what Mother Nature has intended to grow in that area. However, if you're on a 60 by 100 foot lot in a suburban neighborhood, mm, chances are <laughs> you're going to end up being, to a certain extent, and depending on what the final product is, you're going to be that house because, I mean, let's face it, if you took natives from Florida, natives from the Midwest, natives from the Northwest, or here in the Northeast, and tried to make them really work in your little suburban neighborhood, sometimes it just doesn't look that natural. Oh, they may thrive, they may do well, but, mm, you know, it's just not going to look as if you went out into the forest or out into the prairie or out into the swampies and you said, gosh, my yard didn't turn out like that. So be careful when you go native. Be careful and do some due diligence. I really suggest hard, strongly. Most native plants, no matter where they're coming from, sprout, 
grow and have one thing in mind at all times. Their whole purpose in existence is procreation and reproduction. It really is. They have to continue their species. So they sometimes do a lot of good flowering. Sometimes they do some spreading. Sometimes they do some seed dispersal that isn't always, always a desired trait in a small residential yard. Now, if you're out in the country, you're on a couple acres or larger, and okay, all right, knock yourself out. You know, it, you, can, you can find native seeds and native plants online. I, like I was perusing Marketplace this morning, Facebook Marketplace. And oh my gosh, there's lots of people out there selling all kinds of things. And so you can, you can find what you need. It's just a matter of be prepared for any sort of side effects of the plants that you do use. So the scientist out there called plant hybridists came about decades and decades and decades ago to take some natives, to take some wild plants and hybridize them into a carefully formulated breed of the same plant without all the negative side effects. One of the positives you really get from native landscapes most of the time is you do tend to have a little less maintenance. And I say that with a really, a lot of reservation because sometimes you have to do a lot of deadheading. You don't want everything to go to seed, etc. So native landscapes, hey, cool. Try them out. See what you think. But I would try it in a corner of your yard to start with, not the whole thing, and see how it goes. And if it goes well, then hey, make a, make a full landscape makeover and, and go native with whatever you feel like using. Okay, let's move on. Number two, something that is uh, often called kitchen gardens, kitchen landscapes, edible gardens, edible landscapes. With inflation being a runaway freight train right through our wallets lately, I mean, the price of gas and food and some of the most expensive stuff in a grocery store is produce now. Many folks have changed parts of their landscape, if not a lot of their landscape, and converted them into food production. And they have woven it, either the, with the help of professionals or by themselves, they've woven it into the landscape so they have a uh, theme, shall we say, of edibles. And generally, I've always kind of described an edible landscape as something that you have at least 60% of the landscape at one time of the year or another is edible whether it is bearing fruit, uh, bearing root crop, bearing leaf crop, whatever it might be, somewhere, somehow, in some place, people can go out and harvest. And people use a lot of different things. They use a lot of different herbs, uh, semi-dwarf and dwarf citrus and fruit trees. Yes, it's, there are those people who still have a traditional veggie, veggie garden out in the corner somewhere or a container veggie garden. But I'm talking about weaving it into the landscape and using plants and vegetables that have bold, dramatic look. I can remember when I first started my landscape design career, way back in the, don't laugh now, late 1970s, you know, one of the most popular landscape plants that we used to design into yards was artichoke. <laughs> yeah, seriously, artichokes. Those bold gray leaves, especially the new growth where it was just a almost a silver, powder-coated silver leaf, uh, was often used as backdrop plants. And in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was a great, great area for artichokes. It was really close and in very uh, similar proximity to the Monterey Coast area where artichokes are, a lot of them are grown by the hundreds and hundreds of acres. So. Yeah, there was just an example. But nowadays, people are gravitating away from the traditional uh, bluegrass lawns and mulberry shade tree and whatever. And now we're finding genetic dwarf fruit trees, semi-dwarf fruit trees, berries on trellises, leafy greens and root crops, all being weaved into existing areas that means of supplying fresh crop and fresh produce right from your yard and right into your kitchen. And it is becoming a tsunami of popularity. It really is. Okay, let's move on to number three. 
Here's a theme that is based solely around, and I don't think this will ever go away as far as a trend, but uh, it's the privacy theme. You know, with a lot of uh, yards getting smaller, houses getting bigger, and still the popular two-story home mixed in with the developer's one-story affordability home mixed into developments, you're always going to have those homes that have privacy issues. And the privacy trend is, is something that uh, gets creative with a combination of fencing, screening, and uh, greenscape. It really is. So most of the, the trending type of privacy is horizontal screening around patios and around decking and stuff like that. Fence line plantings with arborvitaes, the narrow arborvitaes, many junipers, stuff like that. They get, they get tall enough, although sometimes if you have a one-story home with a backyard and like a design that I had to do many years ago, you were surrounded, surrounded on three different sides with two-story homes. It's going to be very, very hard to get a completed privacy when it comes to that. Your privacy is going to be based on uh, years down the road when things have grown up, hopefully. That's why out west, where I practiced, Italian cypress was so popular because it was fast growing and it got tall enough to even screen two-story homes out from other homes. I don't suggest Italian cypress. It, it's got its issues. But what I did do and what I have seen now, and it's still a trend now and into the future, and that is more like privatizing your outdoor living area. Not necessarily all of your fence line, unless you're a very patient person, but to privatize your patio area, the views into your private areas of your home, uh, using screening, using greenscape, etc. So your bedroom windows, your bathroom windows, your patios, your barbecue area, etc. You don't have to have the nosy neighbor up in the in the bedroom window looking at you with binoculars or something. The downside to this style of landscape is time. Time is uh, for the greenscape anyway to grow. Now I did a job many years ago where a similar situation like this happened. A, a guy. A local business owner where I worked wanted to screen off the neighbor who moved in who seemed to always want to, you know, peek through the fence and et cetera. So he ordered up some big emerald arborvitaes in bald and burlap out of Oregon and had them shipped down. And we're talking arborvitaes that were already 12 feet tall. And I had to plant them along a, a fence line. And when they got in and they got established, it was insta privacy. The house next to my client was a one story. The only thing separating him was a six foot fence. Now he had, minus the root ball now, he had easily 10 feet of privacy screen. And I had to put them about four feet on center. So they were almost touching when I put them in the ground. So something to think about. The privacy trend will always be there. there it just will. It's not something that's ever going away anytime soon. Okay, number four. This one is uh, <laughs> this one is user dependent, shall we say? User dependent. It is the time and tested low maintenance trend in the landscape. This definition means many things to many people, but with families seemingly always having their tachometer in the red zone, uh, because life and jobs and the world and everything is so fast paced, the landscape tends to. Uh, sometimes fall off our top three priority list. But these particular landscapes, uh, done correctly, allow for some forgiveness of the homeowner. And when I say that is, hey, if you missed a week, okay, no big deal. You know, come out and rake the leaves next week or pull a weed or two next month or whatever. Uh, it's not like having a, a large expanse of lawn that needs mowing during the growing season every week. And mostly I would say that the trend of low maintenance always lends itself to lawnless landscapes. Let's face it, the, the lawn itself, the element of turf requires more water, more food, more maintenance, and more time of a homeowner 
than any other part of the landscape period. So by converting it into a lawnless landscape and using things more along the lines of ground cover, small dwarf shrubberies, hardscape surfaces that maybe are a little more expansive, drip irrigations, maybe some lighting and that is it, really curbs that uh, weekly maintenance and kind of lends itself to more like quarterly tidying up, if you get my meaning. For me, hey, even here at Brook and Pond, next year when I finally, knock on wood, am able to break ground, we will have a lawnless landscape. The lawn that is out here will probably be going bye-bye, at least well over half of it, because it's just useless. It's a useless, huge useless space of 12,000 square feet. My gosh, that's, uh, that's twice as much as some city residential lots, and it's in grass. And when we first moved in, back in October, hey, I was out there every week mowing. So. Yeah, I'm not going back to that kind any, anymore. So with the low maintenance landscape, shrub, shrubberies and stuff are complemented with usually smaller trees and ground covers and then mulches and gravels and other things tend to cover the ground surface. And if you do it right, man, it was my bread and butter for many, many years. Lawnless landscape and converted it from a water thirsty. I can remember going from one of my clients in Galt, California. She went from a $300 a month water bill. And by the time we got things installed, somewhat established, so we're talking about three months after installation, her water bill went from $300 a month to 70. All of that was landscape factor, what was put in the ground. And we used a combination of gravel ground cover, fabrics, containers, some stuff in the ground, but not all of it, some existing, some were removed, and everything was converted to drip, and it worked out really well. She was very, very happy with that. Um, you know, if you figure you're saving $230 a month, hey, add that up, and you get quite a return on your investment, that's for sure. Okay, let's move on to number five. Number five is a trend that will be around, yeah, I'll use Brook and Pond as an example. Think about the title that we put to this place. It is the element of water in the landscape. I can remember coming here with my agent, and I had no idea except for the look of the house what, what we were going to see. And we turned off the county road and onto the property, and the first thing we did is we passed over a perennial brook flowing in the middle of the summer, late summer, first of August, and it was still cranking. And I just went, oh my God, this is going to be the place. And we drove up the driveway and we saw the house. It looked basically like the pictures. And then I saw the pond. And the pond had a brook that came into it and a brook that flowed on the outflow of the earthen dam. And I had a second sound of water. Then the look of the pond itself, although I did spend the first three weeks just beating the hell out of the perimeter of the pond because it was, it was neglected and overgrown. Uh, but hey, this year, resources allowing, be able to put a nice deck out there, put a bug room, because <laughs> Maine does tend to get bugs in the early summertime, and be able to enjoy the pond out there as well. So water elements and the trend of using water, flowing water, spilling water, whatever it might be, is a, a trend that is just timeless. You know, water elements in the landscape still remain a very popular trending theme to a sliding scale. If you look online, go to Aquascape's website, Atlantis Gardens, Tussie Landscaping, these guys are really, really off the hook experts in installing water themes uh, of all various sizes. Now, for me, when I was doing it, I Remember, my niche market dictated to me that the water features were always going to be smaller in scale, small pondless water features, self-contained basin enclosed water features, and this fit the budgets of the clients that I did. But very, very popular and very, very DIY friendly. A little bit of knowledge, a little bit, uh, a weekend of online searching and online watching, you could put these things in no problem whatsoever. And so people concentrate on the placement. Uh, for me as a designer, 
it was always you were going to have the sound of water where you wanted it most, whether that be falling asleep outside the master bedroom, seeing it from the family room, hearing it and seeing it when people, including the owners, came to their front door areas. These were, the placement was very, very important. And the cost, yeah, there, there's, a, there's an additional cost there. You got to get electricity to them, you know, or at least nearby, and then take care of them a little bit. I'll tell you one thing, at Weed Patch Ranch, when Maestro and I sold, we had the nice pondless waterfall in the backyard, and we had the stacked slate urn out in the front yard. And you want to talk about a wildlife magnet? Holy crap. There was birds, there was frogs, there was toads, there was uh, lizards, there were birds, there were coyotes, there were raccoons, there were skunks, there were ground squirrels. We were, especially in the heat of the summer, the standing source of water for a lot of wildlife within a reasonable area. And I can remember coming outside and finding two coyotes, you know, asleep on my front lawn out there underneath an olive tree. Uh, with the water feature just a few feet away. So it was really kind of neat. Uh, lots, of, lots of pictures, lots of uh, satisfaction with having a water feature in my landscape. And you can too. It's not that hard. I would say for a stacked slate urn uh, with a 45-inch basin and a pump with a little bit of electric available to you, you can have that thing in as a rookie you can have that thing in less than a day. For me, it generally took about, eh, depending on how hard it was to dig, less than four hours. So water features are definitely going to be a part. And there's so many sizes and styles. Your imagination and your checkbook are the only limitations. So check them out. Number six is going to be uh, lovingly referred to as escape pods. Escape pods are a new and very popular trend in landscaping, and yet it is more of a hardscape feature than a greenscape feature. Oftentimes they're referred to as man caves or she sheds. Uh, incorporating these dwellings, shall we say, incorporating these sheds, I like to call them retreats, are very, very popular. It's kind of almost like a, a Star Trek theme, you know, beam me out, Scotty. Get me out of the house, away from the kids, away from the phone, away from computers, blah, 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 and be able to go off into your retreat, your escape pod, where you can go in and do, watch, listen, create, whatever it is uh, out in these spaces. Uh, I've seen them as woodworking. I've seen them as artist studios. Uh, I have seen them as multi-television, game day, cold beer, kager, party palaces, whatever, this day and age are not just for yard tools anymore. They are sheds that provide a retreat and a de-stressor, shall we say, with various degrees of completion based on your budget again. I mean, you can go down to a box store, buy yourself a, a dinky one, and have it delivered and placed in your yard, and then you can do whatever you want to it. You don't even have to build the dang thing. You can have it placed right in your yard. The only thing you got to be worried about is obviously the size based on your available space, what is going to get sacrificed if you're taking something out, and of course, if you're in the ever loving realm of HOA rules, ick, you may have to uh, appeal to the board. Let's hope you're not in that situation. Again, I have seen the Taj Mahal versions online, and I've seen people spending, you know, God knows how much, you know, <laughs> $50,000 to create these things. Now, some people, are they are literally part of their home-based business. It is their office. It is their uh, livelihood where they go to. They have a huge commute from their kitchen door out back right to their office in the backyard, and that's where they conduct their work. And I think that's very, very uh, smart. Don't bother dad and mom while they're working, unless you absolutely have to. And it's an easy way to uh, create surroundings around you that are very personable, rather than going to a sticks and bricks office all the time. All right, our last one, ever-present drought-tolerant landscape. Uh, this is such a, a catch-all in this day and age. Basically, hey, sands the lawn and selects some useful low-maintenance alternatives, like I mentioned in the low-maintenance part. Drip irrigate the thing and boom, drought tolerance is achieved. 
Don't overthink it. Now, do you want to kick it up a notch or two or 10? Okay, then try if you're, if you're in an area of the country or world where droughts do come and go and you cannot predict them. I strongly suggest that by adding a rain capturing system, if you're allowed to do, if, if the government allows you to capture water out of the sky, there are some municipalities and states where this is not legal. <laughs> screw you guys. You know, it's water coming out of the sky. And I can either use water coming out of the tap to water my landscape, or I can capture it and use it during the times of drought, where I can still have a green landscape, still have veggies and fruit trees and whatever. And then you go one more level and create a solar system that can actually power a 12-volt pump and automation. And now you've kind of been an off-grid landscape. You really are. With very, very drought tolerant plants, even veggies that require only a drip system, man, not only are you drought tolerant, but the low maintenance has dropped tremendously and your water bill is much lower as well. But check yourself before you wreck yourself here. All of these trends all sounds good, right? Based on those items I mentioned in the beginning, you must apply to these trends in order to pull them off and have them look good not just for the birthday party next Saturday. This is good for the long haul. This is an investment in the real estate that you have bought and you're making monthly payments on. So think it out. If you don't have a lot of landscape skills, please bounce over to the, the website, youryardcoach.com, and check out the book and check out the digital course. Check out the checklist. I mean, it can really go a long ways to bouncing your educational level up quite a few notches and give you an idea of what it actually takes to take on a project. Be realistic, but remain positive and know that it can, all of these can be done DIY. Learn, grow, and execute, and when you are ready, tackle it and enjoy the journey through it. Yeah, there's going to be some hard parts. Yeah, there's going to be some times where you're, why in the Sam hell did I take this on? But hey, you got a coach you can always fall back on. You can always email me. I can get you through it one way or another. You know, bone up on your inner landscaper this winter. Just remember that education and knowledge is power and that empowerment can go a long ways to actually seriously considering you being able to do it. And a landscape bill at the end of the project that's probably 50% less than if you went out and hired. So check it out. Hey, as always, I really appreciate any support you do over on the website. As always to your landscape success, and I'll catch you guys next Friday. Really appreciate your time. I know this is coming in uh, December of 2023, so I always say happy holidays. Hope everything's going well. Bye for now, guys. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show and we'll see you right here next week.